I'm going to uh, take some friends over to my aunt's house so every time she makes a promise I'm going to have witnesses. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce Jordan Ayton. Is it Ayton or Atten? It's Ayton. Ayton. Good guess. Jordan M. Ayton joined the firm in 1999 and is one of the firm's counsel. Jordan also maintains a mediation practice through Hall Estate Mediation. Jordan, what firm are you with? Ian's firm. Ian's firm. Yeah. Jordan was appointed as one of Ontario's first certified specialists in estates and trust law. He is a current chair of the Ontario Bar Association Estate Section. Mr. Aiken is the inaugural recipient of the Hofstein Prize, recognizing his contribution and achievements in estate law. He is the co-author of The Family War, Winning the Inheritance Battle, and appears on Canada AM and the Business News Network as an, estate on, as an expert on estate matters. He is a frequent speaker at Osgoode Hall Law School, Ontario Bar Association, and Law Society Upper Canada programs on estate matters. Jordan is also a contributor to the text Estate Litigation and the author of numerous articles on estate matters. His articles are referred to in many of Canada's leading estates texts. His recent articles include Executor's Compensation, Removal of Executors for Conflict of Interest, The Impact of Marriage on Estate Matters. Jordan has an LLB from Osgoode Hall Law School and he was called to the bar in 1993. I call him George Jordan Aiken. Well, I gotta carry one of these stands around all the time. Makes you feel like Ian Hull. Um, thank you all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, um, I'm going to address briefly the idea that we've heard a little bit about, which is domicile, what that means, what that is, and, and why it's important. And my paper is about domicile, it's about the importance of domicile, but it's also about, and Ian talked about coming to Ontario and, our, and certain, certain rules and procedures that may apply in Ontario that don't apply in other jurisdictions. I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact of the, the reality of costs in will challenges and if you're going to litigate in Ontario or you have to litigate in Ontario, um, the relevance of that. So as, um, as Archie said, the will nowadays is sort of like the starting point of things and so costs are relevant because 99% of our cases settle, except the ones that Ian and Archie deal with. I don't know. You guys are busy. Um, all my cases settle. Um, so uh, the reality is costs are a huge issue because if the loser is going to get their costs out of the estate in any, uh, uh, in any reason, for any reason, whether, win or lose, then you're going to negotiate differently. So. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about that in a second, but domicile. So why is domicile important? Domicile is important because domicile affects the personal law. That is, domicile affects what jurisdiction is going to decide whether you're divorced, what jurisdiction is going to decide how your estate is going to be administered, where you're going to challenge a will if beneficiaries are involved, where uh, uh, disgruntled beneficiaries, uh, spouses, children can make dependent support claims. And different jurisdictions obviously have different laws, and some are more uh, supportive of dependents, some are less supportive of dependents. Uh, some are, are more uh, uh, gracious with their cost awards, and some aren't. So that's why domicile is important. A couple of points, they come from this case called Reef Foot Estate, which um, I was assigned by uh, Charles to, uh, to re read, and thank you very much. It was only 546 paragraphs. Uh, most of the state cases are like 15 paragraphs. You found the longest one that I've ever seen, but thanks very much. That was all about where Mr. Foote was domiciled, believe it or not. And uh, Mr. Foote uh, had uh, a small estate of $130 million. Um, and the, the issue is whether he was domiciled in Australia, in which case Australian law would apply, or was he domiciled in Alberta, where he also had property. And Alberta and BC was another potential uh, domicile. And both Alberta and, and BC had much more um, liberal uh, uh, dependent support legislation. And so, of course, the dependents, the spouse, and the kids who were basically cut out of Mr. Foote's estate wanted it to be heard in Alberta or in BC. Some of the kids said BC, some said Alberta. And 
the court made a, a number of, of important issues. Domicile really is not, it's distinguished from residency. So you can be a citizen of one country, you can be resident in another country, and you can be domiciled in a third country. Because domicile is a mental state. It is not only where you live, but where you intend to live for the rest of your life, basically. To end, for, for the rest of your days is the, is the old uh, language. And you can only have one domicile at a time. So when you're born, you have a domicile, you're what's called a domicile of origin. That is your domicile, it's parental domicile, wherever you're born. And, but you can change that. It has to be a voluntary choice. So if I am, uh, Holland Hall sends me to, uh, to Pakistan to open up a, a branch office, don't even think about it, um, uh, then, then just because I'm there working, doesn't mean that I'm domiciled there. I'm resident there, but I'm not domiciled there. Domicile requires the fact that I'm never going to leave Pakistan. Okay? I'm going to stay there for the rest of my days. Um, if I have the intention to come back to, to Ontario, then I'm not domiciled there. Similarly, if I'm a, if I'm a soldier or a, a, an employee of any sort and I'm sent or I go to study someplace, I'm not domiciled. It's in fact difficult to change your domicile. It's not easily displaced. So when you have a domicile of origin, if you then move away, the burden is, is then on the person saying you've changed your domicile for you to, uh, for there to be a finding of that. Um, so what are some of the, uh, the factors? There's both the intention and it's a declared intention. So if you say, you know, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life, if I say that to somebody, that's relevant. If I abandon my old my old domicile, then that also is, is relevant. Um, courts will look at how long am I spending in a certain place? Do I bring my family along? Um, do I go back to my old uh, place, What's to my old uh, location? What are the economic links to the juris jurisdiction? Where do I have my passport? Things like that, with my social integration. Those are all uh, relevant in the in the idea of domicile, and so in that case, after 546 pages, to be honest with you, I skipped to the end. I did that. <laughs> I read the end first. He's domiciled in Australia, and so these these dependents uh, really they don't they don't do well because uh, Australian law didn't didn't help them too much. So, um, so that's uh, that's what uh, the court did in that case. So domicile is obviously crucial. Um, just briefly on cost, because I only have a couple of minutes. Historically, we always thought uh, that, look, if you bring a... Sorry? I've got 10 minutes. I know, but I like to be shorter. So, um, so the, the idea with cost is, if you brought a will challenge in Ontario, historically, really in most common law countries, and you had a pretty good, a good shot at it, you might not win, but you had a good reason to challenge, you got your costs out of the estate. Everybody got their costs out of the estate. The purpose, the reason behind that rule is before a court is going to pronounce a will valid, they want to know that there are no, that this really was the, the, a valid will. And so the fact that somebody is making the, uh, the, the propounder of the will propound the will, that is say, prove it that it's valid, the cost should come out of the estate. In the last few years, we've seen a dramatic, I would say a dramatic shift, where they say, one court said, look, the estate is no longer the ATM machine, uh, which is terrible news for those of us at that table, but that's the life, right? That's life. So they said, we're going to treat it like regular litigation in Canada. If you win, you get costs from the other side. If you lose, you pay costs to the winning side. Well, that's foreign to us as estate lawyers, and that's why we all went into the business, because we didn't have that rule. So. Um, but nowadays, they're going to look hard at the, at, the, at the merits of the case, at the conduct of the parties, and whether the, whether the will challenge was, was, right, was right. In other words, did you have a good reason to do it? And when you no longer had a good reason to keep challenging it, did you, did you say, okay, we quit? Because if, you have, if you're not sure at the beginning, and most of the time, let's be honest, we're not sure if we have a good will challenge or not. We, we know, maybe know a few facts. We don't have the medical records. We don't know what the lawyers discussions where we don't know any of that. And so at the beginning, we don't know what's going on. But at a certain point, when we see you know, Dr. Shulman's uh, report that says, look, this guy had capacity, there's no question. And, and when we see that and we hear that the lawyer who drafted the will, Ian Hull, 
you know, notwithstanding that he didn't have each page initialed, is still he still believed that it was uh, the, this guy had testamentary capacity. We got to say, okay, you know what? We tried. We're out. If we keep going, we're gonna we're gonna face significant cost sanctions. My, I'm gonna spend the last minute on my take on this idea. My view is, if a parent is going to cut out a child, which is really when we're talking about most of these will challenges, or treat one child differently, then if they don't have the guts to tell that child, by the way, I'm cutting you out of the will, and that child then, so they're not told this, and then when the parent dies, they find out, look, oh my gosh, I'm, uh, I'm not getting as much as my sibling, I guess my mom didn't love me as much as, as, as she loved my other, uh, my other siblings then that child has the right to challenge that will. Because the testator is at fault here. The testator set up, un, set up expectations that were unmet. And if you're not going to have the guts to tell the kid that they're not getting anything, then you shouldn't have the guts to draw a will that cuts them out. You should tell them what's going on so that they can, uh, th their expectations uh, are, are, are uh, realistic. And so my argument would be that if a, if a testator doesn't do that and decides you're out and I'm not telling you, uh, that that is the fault of the testator. And then if that child challenges the will, win or lose, they should have uh, some right to costs out of the estate. Um, that's my take. It's not going anywhere, by the way, because I wasn't appointed to the bench. Um, as a, uh, yeah, so... If I ever wrote that in a letter, I'm sure Archie would write back, uh, sorry, I missed your appointment to the bench, as he, as he has done before. Um, but anyway, th those are my comments. Uh, domicile is, uh, is important, but costs, when we get, if, if, if we are domiciled in Ontario, costs are really um, changing and have to be taken into account. Thanks so much.